Part two, chapter fourteen of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter fourteen, eighteen eleven to eighteen thirteen, an audience with Napoleon. A few days later, we returned to Brussels, where the Emperor was expected during the spring. His brother Louis had deserted the throne of Holland where the iron hand of Napoleon had prevented him from carrying out his policy for the good of the country. He had left in Holland a very honourable record, as I know from King William himself. The people felt very differently about the administration of Monsieur de Selle, the son-in-law of Madame de Valence, whose memory there has been held in horror. The Emperor appointed him préfet at Amsterdam, where he did all the evil of which a man is capable who is absolutely devoid of principle. It was towards the spring of this year, 1811, as nearly as I can remember, that we received the visit, always dreaded by the préfet, of a council of state en mission, a kind of spy of high rank determined to find fault even with those whom he could not help esteeming. Monsieur Royal fell to the lot of Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, who realised at the time of the first visit that he would endeavour to do him all the harm possible. Nevertheless, during his sojourn we gave him a dinner, followed by a reception. I had said to the ladies who had shown kindness to me that they would do me a favour in coming to pass the evening with us. After dinner, on returning to the Grand Salon, we found united there all the most distinguished persons of the city of Brussels, both men and women. Monsieur Réal was stupefied by the names, the manners and the jewels. He could not refrain from saying to Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, Monsieur, voilà un salon qui m'offisque terriblement. To which my husband replied, I'm very sorry, but fortunately it does not have the same effect on the Emperor. The 19th of September, 1811, the Emperor set out from Paris to visit the camp at Boulogne, the French fleet and the north of the Empire. The Empress went to Laken, near Brussels, where she arrived the night of the 21st or 22nd of September. We were invited to come to Laken every day to pass the evening and to play at Lotto. This lasted for a week and was very boring. The Empress on every occasion showed the greatest insipidness. Every day she said the same thing to me in giving me her pulse to count. Do you think that I have any fever? To which I invariably replied, Madame, I do not know anything about it. The Duc de Selle was charged with the task of arranging the morning promenades according to the weather. One day when Marie-Louise visited the museum, she seemed to be struck by a handsome portrait of her illustrious grandmother, Marie-Thérèse. The Duc d'Orso proposed to her to place the portrait in a salon at Laken. She replied, Oh no, the frame is too old. Another time he suggested, as an interesting promenade, that part of the forest of Swine known as the pilgrimage of the Archiduchesse Isabel, whose sanctity and goodness have remained in the hearts of the people. She replied that she did not like the woods. In fine, this insignificant woman, so unworthy of the great man whose destiny she shared, seemed to make it a point to be as disagreeable as possible to the Belgians, whose hearts were so disposed to love her. I never saw her again until after she lost her throne, and then she was still as destitute of intelligence. During the summer of 1811, Monsieur de Talleyrand came to preside over an electoral college, summoned, I think, to elect a senator and two deputies to the corps législatif. He arrived with a large household and gave several dinners in the fine apartments of the Hotel d'Arenberg, placed at his disposal by the blind duke. 
on this occasion he showed again all his great and charming manners which contrasted in a comical fashion with those of the archbishop of madine who had the appearance of a scapin in a violet cassock about the middle of the spring of eighteen twelve we began to see troops passing through on their way to germany several regiments of the young guard came to brussels and remained there other regiments only passed through the city instructions were received to bring together the farmers wagons hitched to four horses sometimes the order was received only in the morning and it was necessary the same evening to have eighty or one hundred wagons assembled provided with forage for two days the gendarmes had to gallop in every direction to notify the farmers the latter obliged to leave their ploughs and their work were in very bad humour but who would have dared to resist the thought never occurred to any one from bayonne to hamburg we served several substantial meals to the corps of officers who came at ten o'clock in the evening and left at midnight doubtless very few of these brave fellows ever returned from this disastrous campaign no one had any idea that a french army would go as far as moscow therefore when my husband upon his return from a trip of several days to paris brought back a very fine map of poland and russia we were astonished that la Pie had added upon the margin a little square of paper on which was the name of moscow the map did not go as far as the meridian of that city and when pinned to the draperies of the salon everyone thought that this precaution on the part of the map-maker was very unnecessary it was a prognostic during the last months of this same year young auguste de beaufort paid very marked attentions to my elder daughter charlotte who at this time was sixteen years of age she was very tall and without being pretty had a very distinguished air she was a noble demoiselle in every sense of the term in this affair both the heart and mind of young Lidekoke were involved he felt that mademoiselle de la tour du pin with her personal charms her name and her connections although without fortune suited him better than some good belgian girl who was very rich and very obscure he declared to his parents that he would not marry any other woman than my daughter his father raised some objections but his mother in the hope that the political career of her son would be favoured by a marriage which would take him out of his country obtained the consent of her husband the first day of the year eighteen thirteen at ten o'clock in the morning madame de lidicourt was announced she demanded the hand of my daughter for her son i was prepared for this request which i received and agreed to with pleasure madame de lidicourt wished to see my daughter whom she embraced and it was arranged that the marriage should take place within six weeks my daughter Cécile was at the convent of the Dame de Berlaymont, where she had been for six months preparing for her first communion. I promised to take her out the day of her sister's marriage. At the same time, we received news that Humbert, then sous-préfet at Florence, had just been named as sous-préfet at Sens, Department of the Yonne. This news filled the measure of our contentment. My husband had gone to Nivelle to be present at the drawing of the conscription, necessitated by the continuation of the war which the Emperor had undertaken. I was alone at home before luncheon when I saw the secrétaire général of the prefecture enter with a dejected face. He informed me that the courier from Paris had just brought word of the dismissal of my husband and of his replacement by Monsieur de Houdetot, préfet of Ghent this news struck me like a thunderclap and in it i saw at the first moment a cause of breaking off the marriage of my daughter however i made up my mind not to yield without a fight 
Without awaiting the return of my husband, to whom I had sent a courier, I decided to leave at once for Paris. I owe it to Monsieur de Liedekerk to state that he came to see me with an eagerness and a warmth which must surprise him now if he recalls this circumstance to beg me not to change our plans in any respect. I left my aunt and Madame de Mauville to pack everything which belonged to us in the prefecture, and at four o'clock I set out for Paris. I had had so many things to do and to arrange in the space of two hours that I was already fatigued when I set out. The night passed in a wretched chaise de poste, and the anxiety caused by our new position gave me quite a high fever, with which I arrived at Paris at ten o'clock in the evening. I went to the house of Madame de Duras, whom I found out. Her daughters had just gone to bed. They arose and sent someone in search of their mother, who, on returning, found me lying on her sofa, worn out with fatigue. There was no room in the apartment to lodge me, but she had the key of the apartment of the Chevalier de Tussy, our common friend. My femme de chambre and the servant, who had followed me, went and prepared a bed in which I took refuge at once. But without finding the repose of which I had great need. The next morning at an early hour, Madame de Dura came with Dr. Oviti, whom she had summoned. He found that I had still a good deal of fever, but I told him that it was necessary for him to get me on my feet at no matter what cost, and that I must be in a state to go to Versailles before night. He then gave me a calming draught, which caused me to sleep until five o'clock. I do not know in what state of health I then found myself, but at any rate, I did not pay any attention to it. I had a carriage called, and dressed in a very elegant toilette, I went in search of Madame de Duras. We set out at once for Versailles, where the Emperor was staying at Trianon. We stopped at an inn, Rue de l'Orangerie, where they put us together in an apartment. I at once opened my inkstand. Madame de Duras, to whom I had confided only my desire to have an audience with His Majesty, saw me take a fine large sheet of paper and then copy a rough draft, which I had drawn from my portfolio, and said to me, To whom are you writing? To whom? I replied. Apparently, to the Emperor. I do not like small measures. The letter written and sealed we again got into a carriage to take it to Trianon. There I asked for the Chamberlain on duty. I had taken the precaution to prepare a little note for him. By a fortunate chance, he was Adrien de Meun, who was one of my best friends. He approached the carriage and promised me that at ten o'clock, when the Emperor came from tea with the Empress, he would hand him my letter. He kept his promise and was as satisfied as he was surprised when, on looking at the address, Napoleon said, speaking to himself, Madame de la Tour du Pin writes very well. It is not the first time that I have seen her handwriting. These words confirmed my suspicion that a certain letter written to Madame de Nîmes had been seized before arriving at its destination. After our trip to Trianon, we returned to our hotel. About ten o'clock in the evening, while Claire and I were debating as to whether I would have my audience, yes or no, the hotel waiter, who up to that moment had considered us as simple mortals, opened the door and cried, De la part de l'empereur! The same moment, a man covered with gold lace entered and said, his Majesty awaits Madame de la Tour du Pin tomorrow at ten o'clock in the morning. The good news did not trouble my slumber. On the following morning, after having drunk a large bowl of coffee, which Claire had prepared with her own hands to brace me up, as she said, I set out for Trianon. I had to wait ten minutes in the salon which preceded the one where Napoleon received. 
I was very glad to find no one there, for I had need of this moment of solitude to arrange my thoughts. A conversation on tete-a-tete with this extraordinary man was an event of great importance in my life, and nevertheless I declare here in all the sincerity of my heart, perhaps with pride, that I did not feel in the least embarrassed. The door opened. The usher, by a gesture, made me a sign to enter, and then closed the double door behind me. I found myself in the presence of Napoleon. He advanced to meet me and said with quite a pleasant air, Madame, I am afraid that you are very much displeased with me. I inclined my head in sign of assent, and the conversation began. Having lost the notes which I wrote of this long audience, which lasted fifty-nine minutes by the clock, after the lapse of so many years I am not able to remember all the details of the interview, the Emperor endeavoured, in short, to prove to me that he had been forced to act as he had done. Then I pictured to him in a few words the state of the society at Brussels, the consideration which my husband had acquired there, compared with all the preceding préfets, the visit of Réal, the stupidity of General Chambelac and of his wife, a religieuse des Franquais, and so on. All this was recited rapidly, and as I was encouraged by his air of approbation, I ended by announcing to the Emperor that my daughter was going to marry one of the greatest seigneurs of Brussels, upon which he interrupted me, placing his beautiful hand upon my arm, and said, J'espère que cela ne fera pas manquer le mariage, et dans ce cas, vous ne devriez pas le regretter. Then, while promenading the length of the large salon, while I followed, walking at his side, he pronounced these words, and it is perhaps the only time in his life that he ever said them, and the privilege was reserved for me to overhear him. I have made a mistake, but what can I do? I replied, Your Majesty can repair the error. Then he placed his hand upon his forehead and said, Ha! Ah, they are at work upon the prefectures. The Minister of the Interior is coming this evening. Then he mentioned the names of four or five departments and added, There is Amiens. Will that suit you? I replied without hesitation, Perfectly, sire. In that case, it is arranged, said he. You can go and notify Montalivet. And with that charming smile of which so much has been said, après son m'avez-vous pardonné? I replied to him in my best manner, J'ai besoin aussi de votre majesté me pardonne de lui avoir parlé si librement. Oh, vous avez très bien fait. I made a courtesy, and he went to the door, which he opened for me himself. On coming out, I found Adrien de Meun and Juste Noé, who asked me if I had arranged my business. I only replied that the Emperor had been very kind to me. Without losing time, I entered my carriage, and taking Madame de Duras, who, unable to overcome her impatience, had come to await me in an allée of Trianon, we returned to Paris. After having left Madame de Dura at her door, I went to see Monsieur de Montalivet, where I arrived at about 2.30 o'clock. He received me in a friendly manner, but with a very sad air, saying, Ah, I could do nothing to prevent it. The Emperor is very displeased with your husband. They have told him a thousand tales. They pretend that people went to your house as to a court. With the idea of amusing myself a little with him, I replied, But would it not be possible to find another place for my husband? Oh, I would never dare to propose such a thing to the Emperor. When he is put out, justly or unjustly with anyone, it is very difficult to change him. Well, I replied with a hypocritical air, it is necessary to bow the head. However, as you were going to Trianon to present four nominations for prefets to be signed, but 
how do you know that he cried hastily without having the appearance of understanding i added you will propose monsieur de la tour du pain for the prefecture of amiens he looked at me with stupefaction and i continued very simply the emperor has charged me to tell you that monsieur de montalivet gave an exclamation took my hands with much friendship and interest and at the same time looking at me from head to foot indeed he said i should have divined that that pretty toilette this morning was not intended for me the nomination of monsieur de la tour du pain appeared the same evening in the moniteur and i received the compliments of all the people of my acquaintance who had been afflicted by the news of his disgrace in fact this dismissal was a fortunate event for my husband as you will see later on i remained several days at paris where i awaited my husband and the comte de Liedekerk, who came to rejoin me for the signature of the contract of marriage at this time there was an assembly at court and i went with madame de Meun. i was dressed very simply without a single gem contrary to the custom of the ladies of the empire who were covered with jewels i found myself placed in the last row in the throne room where i was a head taller than two little women who had placed themselves unceremoniously before me the emperor entered he glanced his eyes over the three rows of ladies spoke to several with an inattentive air and then having perceived me he smiled in that manner which all the historians have endeavoured to describe and which was truly remarkable from the contrast it presented to the usual expression of his face which was always serious and often severe but the surprise of my neighbours was great when napoleon still smiling addressed me these words et vous content de moi madame the persons who surrounded me then withdrew to the right and left and i found myself without knowing how in the front rank i thanked the emperor in an accent of very sincere gratitude after several very amiable words he passed on this was the last time i saw this great man i set out for brussels where i was very desirous of seeing my children and where i had besides a thousand things to do my husband went by way of amiens to prepare for our installation he then came to rejoin me with Humbert, who was back from florence and who had received at paris his nomination as sous-préfet de sens who could have possibly foreseen at that moment that ten months later he would be chased from that city by the Württembergers. When M. de la Tour du Pin arrived at Brussels, he found me settled with my children, with the Marquis de Trésigny, who had offered us a very cordial hospitality. M. Dutot had announced, without delicacy, that he would take possession of the prefecture the second day after the date of my return to Brussels. I was desirous that he should find no vestige of our sojourn of five years on the house which he was to inhabit everything which belonged to us was packed and dispatched as for the furniture of the prefecture every article had been put back in the place designated by the infantry nothing was lacking monsieur Dutot was rather put out by this exactitude and was even more disturbed by the regrets which all classes loudly expressed over the recall of monsieur de la tour du pin he found a pretext to return to ghent and lived there until after our departure which was fixed for the second of april my daughter was to be married the twentieth my husband could say with guzman j'étais maître en ces lieux sir j commande encore he therefore summoned the chief of police, Monsieur Malais, and enjoined him to see that there was no manifestation to pronounce on the part of the people on the occasion of the marriage of our daughter. The mayor, the Duc d'Ursel, to the same end, fixed an advance star of the evening, half past ten, for the marriage at the municipality. This did not prevent the people 
from assembling in crowds in all the streets through which we were to pass in going to the Hôtel de Ville, which was brilliantly illuminated. On all sides we heard only expressions of regret and kindness in connection with Monsieur de la Tour du Pin. When we returned after the civil marriage at the Hôtel de Ville to the house of Madame de Trasigny, we found all the salons of the ground floor lighted up, and in the street under the windows was a large band composed of all the musicians of the city to give us a serenade. My husband was naturally very much pleased at this manifestation of the public goodwill. The following day, my daughter was married in the private chapel of the Duc d'Ursel. After a fine déjeuner attended by relatives and friends, she left with her husband for the Chateau de Noisy, situated near Dinan in the Belgian Ardennes. There her father-in-law had preceded her by several hours. I accompanied them as far as Tillemont. Up to this moment, I have not spoken again of Monsieur de Chambeau, our friend and companion in misfortune during our emigration to America. He had fallen into possession of a small fortune and had passed at Brussels the greater part of his leisure time. His business, however, obliged him to make long sojourns in the south of France. For a year past, he had occupied at Antwerp a position which was temporary, it is true, but which held out the assurance of advancement. When he learned of the catastrophe which had forced our departure from Brussels so suddenly, he came at once, and knowing the bad state of our affairs, he said to my husband, You are about to marry your daughter, and at the same time you are losing your position. I have 60,000 francs in securities which I have brought you. Use them as your own. He was present at the marriage of Charlotte, who was his goddaughter. At the moment I write these lines at Pisa in the beginning of the year 1845, I do not know anything more about this excellent man. I saw him again ten years ago at Paris. At this time he was living in a little country house at Epigny, where he had fallen entirely under the influence of two young serving maids, who had acquired an unfortunate control over his old age. They took care to prevent him from coming near us. Our poor friend is probably no longer living. End of Part 2, Chapter 14「Part 2 Chapter 15 of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 15, 1813 to 1814 Return of the King It was in the month of April 1813 that we arrived at Amiens, where we were destined to see happen events which we were far from looking for, here we found our brother-in-law, the Marquis de la Mette, whose friendship had already assured us a very favourable reception on the part of the nobility and of the people of importance in the city, who up to then had been very much dissatisfied with their préfets. The house set apart for the préfecture was charming. It had just been entirely refurnished with elegance and luxury. The ground floor comprised a complete apartment, where I lived with my husband. On one side was the cabinet of the préfet, communicating with the bureaus. The house looked out on a magnificent garden of seven or eight acres, well cultivated. This gave us almost the pleasure of being in the country. The first days of summer passed very agreeably. We often went to dinner in the neighbourhood with friends who resided there during the fine season. My daughter Cécile, who was thirteen years of age at this time, already showed a very great talent for music, and also had a charming voice of great compass. During the five years that we had passed at Brussels, I had given her an excellent teacher in Italian. Formerly from Rome, and not knowing French, he had taught my daughter to use the fine Roman idiom. She expressed herself in this language with facility. 
Charlotte and she also read not only Italian, but also English. We were very well settled at Amiens when we commenced to hear the grumbling of the storm. Everyone was so confident of the fortunes of Napoleon that the idea did not occur to anyone to admit that he could possibly have any other enemy to fear than the frosts that had been so fatal to him during the Russian campaign. However, after the Battle of Leipzig, there began the requisitions, the enlisting of men and the organisation of guards of honour. This last measure caused desolation among the families. Under these circumstances, my husband had need of all his firmness. He served the government in good faith, and the thought of the restoration had not yet occurred to his mind. He neither foresaw it nor desired it. All the faults and all the vices which had been the causes of the first revolution were still too fresh in his memory for him to desire to see the exiled royal family return, bringing in its train the former weakness and abuses of all kinds. The expression so well justified, they have learned nothing and forgotten nothing, often came to his mind. However, he endeavoured so far as possible to mitigate the application of the rules for the organisation of the Guard of Honour. The greatest resistance to certain measures was found among the rich classes, and I often heard him say, they give their children more willingly than their money. In a city devoted to the manufacture of woollens like Amiens, the requisitions were very burdensome, and my husband suspected above all things the greediness and the rascality of the requisitionnaires. The cannon of Long, which we heard at Amiens, gave us the first news of the invasion of French territory. Several days later, Monsieur Duto, the préfet of Brussels, fleeing before the invasion, entered our salon one evening, at the very moment that the receiver-general, Monsieur Dobiser, who saw everything in a rosy light, was saying to us that he had just received a letter from Brussels and that Belgium was in no danger of a coup de main. Soon afterwards we were informed of the appearance of a corps of Cossacks commanded by General Geismar in the plains around the city. It was at this time that General Dupont passed through Amiens under the escort of the gendarmes. He had previously been transferred from the Chateau of Joux when Napoleon had had him confined, after the capitulation of Bailen, to the citadel of Doulon. They were now conducting him to Tours, in order that he might not fall into the hands of the Allies. He did not go any further than Paris, however, and the severity with which he was treated made his fortune. The Cossacks approached so near to Amiens that they could be seen from the tower of the cathedral. The squadron of cavalry in garrison in the city, commanded by our worthy major, presented such a formidable appearance that they did not appear again. My aunt, Madame Denin, was settled for the autumn at the Chateau of Mouchy, near Beauvais, with her friend, the Princesse de Poix. Madame de Dura was also there with her daughters, and they invited me to come and pass several days. My husband urged me to accept, and asked me to return by way of Paris, to see Monsieur de Talleyrand and ascertain the news. Monsieur de Talleyrand had sent him a note by Merlin de Thionville, but this note was so nonsensical, and the reputation of the bearer was so bad, that my husband, averse to all intrigue, was afraid of being drawn in spite of himself, into some adventure of Monsieur de Talon, who hesitated at nothing and who willingly pushed other people forward, while quite ready to abandon them later on to save himself. I accordingly set out for Mouchy, where I remained three days. I left in the morning after breakfast to return to Amiens by way of Paris. Not wishing to pass the night there, I stopped at the apartment of Monsieur de Lally, who was at Mouchy. 
After the time necessary to make a slight change in my toilette, I went to see Monsieur de Talleyrand, whom I found alone in his room. He received me as always with that familiar grace which he has ever shown towards me. People have said many hard things of him, and perhaps he has merited even worse, so that the expression of Montesquieu regarding Caesar could well be applied to him. Mais cet homme extraordinaire avait tant de grandes qualités sont pas un défaut, quoi qu'il ait bien des vices. Well, in spite of everything, he possessed a charm which I have never found in any other man. It was all very well to be armed at all points against his immorality, his conduct, his life, against everything with which he was reproached. Nevertheless, he attracted you as a bird is fascinated by the eye of the serpent. There was nothing particularly remarkable about our conversation that day. I noticed only that he repeated with a certain affectation that Monsieur de la Touripin was well, very well, to be at Amiens. I informed him of my intention to leave in the morning. He told me not to do so. The Emperor was expected in the course of the next day. He would see him and would come to find me after his interview and would let me know at what hour I could command my post horses, which would certainly not be before ten o'clock in the evening. I returned home very much put out of being kept another twenty-four hours in Paris. After having written my husband to notify him of this delay, I endeavoured to occupy the morning of the day following in going to breakfast with my good friend Madame de Morville, and in making several calls. At ten o'clock my horses were attached and waiting at the door. The postillion was beginning to get impatient as well as I myself when Monsieur de Talleyrand arrived. What folly to set out in this cold, he said, but above all things in a calèche. But whose apartment is this? That of Monsieur Lally. Then, taking a candle from the table, he began to look at the engravings which were hung in fine frames around the room. Ah, Charles the Second, James the Second, just so. And he put the candle back on the table. Mon Dieu! I cried. Il est bien question de Charles the Second and James the Second. Vous avez vu l'empereur? Comment est-il? Que fait-il? Que dit-il après une défaite? Oh, laissez-moi donc tranquille avec votre empereur. C'est un homme fini. Comment fini? I said. Que voulez-vous dire? Je veux dire, he replied, que c'est un homme qui se cachera sous son lit. This expression at the moment did not surprise me so much as at the end of our conversation. I indeed knew the hatred and rancour of Monsieur de Talleyrand towards Napoleon, but never had I heard him express himself with so much bitterness. I asked him a thousand questions, to which he replied only by the words, Il a perdu tout son matériel. Il est à bout. Voilà tout. Then, searching in his pocket, he brought out a paper printed in English, and while putting two logs on the fire, he added, Let us burn a little more of the wood of poor Lally. Since you know English, read this passage for me. At the same time, he indicated quite a long article marked with a pencil on the margin. I took the paper and read, Dinner given by the Prince Regent to Madame la Duchesse d'Angouleme. I stopped and raised my eyes to his. He had his usual impassable countenance. Go on and read. Your postillion is getting impatient. I resumed my reading. The article gave a description of the dining room, hung in sky-blue satin with bouquets of lilies. The top of the table entirely decorated with this same royal flower, with the service of Sevres, showing views of Paris and so on. Arrived at the end, I stopped, 
and looked at him like one stupefied. He took the paper back, folded it slowly, put it back in his vast pocket, and said, with that sly and malicious smile which he alone possessed, ah, que vous êtes bête. À présent, partez, mais ne vous en rumez pas. Then, ringing, he said to my valet de chambre, call the carriage for madame. He then left me, crying out as he put on his mantle, Give my best regards to Gouverne. I send him that for his breakfast. You will arrive in time. I reached Amiens at so early an hour that my husband had not yet risen. Without losing a moment, I related to him the above conversation, which had worried me during the night to such a degree that I could not sleep. In it, he saw the explanation of certain perplexing expressions of Merlin de Thionville, and he enjoined me to guard as the most absolute secret what I had learned. For if it was by such means, he said, that the Bourbons thought that they could mount the throne, they would not remain there long. A little later, my husband ordered Humbert to leave for Paris to secure further news. My son had been at Amiens for two weeks. Driven from his sous-prefecture by the Württembergers, he had taken refuge with us in order to care for his health, which had been compromised by an attack of pleurisy which he contracted at Sens, and of which he had been very ill when the enemy approached that city. Humbert arrived at the residence of Monsieur de Talleyrand at Paris at the very moment that the latter was receiving as his guest the Emperor Alexander. He passed the night on a bench which Monsieur de Talleyrand had assigned to him, in enjoining him not to move, so that he could find him at hand when he thought that the time had come for him to return to Amiens. At six o'clock in the morning, Monsieur de Talleyrand tapped him on the shoulder. Ambert saw that he was fully dressed. Leave, he said, with a white cockade, and cry, Vive le roi! Ambert was not sure that he was entirely awake. Shaking himself, he set out nevertheless and arrived at Amiens where the news of the events had already been received, and where Monsieur de la Tour du Pain was not entirely sure what position he was going to take. But the voice of the people was not long in making itself heard. The requisitions, the guards of honour and so on, had exasperated all classes of society. In an instant, as by an electric movement, cries of Vive le roi! issued from all mouths. People rushed to the court of the prefecture to demand white cockades, with which Umber on leaving Paris had filled the coffers of his calèche. The supply was soon exhausted. During the day, when the news of the arrival of Louis the Eighteenth became known, people began to pay us marked attention. Several days after, when they learned that the préfet had left for Boulogne to await the arrival of the king, and that his majesty would stop at Amiens, and that he would pass the night at the prefecture, a large number of people came to offer me articles of every nature which could be used to ornament or embellish the house, such as clocks, vases, pictures, flowers, and so on. Monsieur de Durat, having been designated to take up his service with the king as gentleman of the chamber, had passed through the city to go and await the king of Boulogne, in spite of so many changes, he had preserved all the prejudices, all the hatred, all the littleness, all the rancours of other days, as if there had never been a revolution. Monsieur de Poix had also taken the road for Boulogne, but he stopped at Amiens, very much disturbed as to the reception which he might receive from the king, on account of his son, who was Chamberlain of the Emperor, and to his daughter-in-law, who had been lady of the palace of the Empress. But I had no time to raise his courage, and I confided to my daughter Charlotte the task of talking with him, while I superintended the arrangement of the table of twenty-five covers, which the king was to honour with his presence. I was in the dining-room when a gentleman entered and said several words to my servant, in a tone which displeased me. Approaching him, I demanded unceremoniously why he was interfering. 
he endeavoured to make an impression on me by saying that he belonged to the suite of the king. His surprise was very great when he learned that I was determined to remain mistress of my house, and that I was little disposed to let him give orders there. He went away grumbling. It was Monsieur de Blacas. A word from my husband had told me that the king had received him with much kindness, and that he was quartered at the prefecture with the Duchesse d'Angouleme. All was ready at the appointed hour. Twelve young ladies of the city, at the head of whom was my daughter Cécile, were waiting to present their bouquets to Madame. The carriage in which were the king and Madame was drawn by the company of millers of Amiens, who had demanded this ancient privilege. These were the fellows to the number of fifty or sixty, all attired at their own expense in new costumes of grey-white cloth, with large hats of white felt, then drew the royal carriage to the cathedral, where the bishop intoned the te deum. The doors of the church had been kept closed, and were not opened until the moment when the king was seated in his armchair at the foot of the altar. Then, in less than a moment, this immense church was filled to such a point that there was not room for another person. In thinking at this writing of the innumerable stupidities which later precipitated his brother Charles X from the throne, I have almost a feeling of shame at the recollection of the emotion which I felt on seeing this old man thanking God for having replaced him upon the throne of his father's. Madame knelt at the foot of the altar in tears, and my heart shared the sentiments which she felt. Alas, this solution did not endure for twenty-four hours. The flower-dealers then conducted the king to the prefecture, where he received the whole city, men and women, before dinner, with that grace, with that presence of mind, with that charm which eminently distinguished him. At seven o'clock we sat down at the table. The dinner was excellent, the wines perfect, which particularly pleased the king, and which brought me many kind compliments. It was then for the first time that this simple provincial gentleman, Monsieur de Blacas, who had thought that he could issue his commands, discovered that in the wife of the prefet he had to deal with a former lady of honour. He was very much confused by his mistake and paid me a thousand compliments in the endeavour to make me forget his first attitude, but without success. My cousin Edward Jerningham and his charming wife had accompanied the King from England to France, and His Majesty stated with much kindness that Edward had been of great service to his cause in the English journals by the articles which he had written, which had had a very great success. Both Edward and his wife suggested that the extremely English costume of Madame would displease the court of Napoleon, which was united at Compiègne to await the new sovereign. Both of them represented the necessity of not alienating sympathy at the very beginning. At their suggestion, I spoke of the matter to Mademoiselle de Choisy, Lady of Honour to Madame, and to Monsieur de Blacas, who spoke about it to the King but nothing could overcome the obstinacy of this princess. My son-in-law had ceased to be a Frenchman, and had now become a subject of the new king of the Low Countries, William I, who was the same prince d'Orange whom I had seen in England under very different circumstances. He returned with my daughter to Brussels to his family, and this separation was very grievous to me. I went back to Paris, and we established ourselves, my husband and I, in a pretty apartment, 6 Rue de Varenne, where my son Humbert was also located. The very evening of my arrival, I went with Madame de Dura to a fete which was given by Prince Schwarzenberg, Generalissimo of the Austrian troops. There I saw all the conquerors, and was witness of all the baseness with which they were surrounded and, so to speak, overwhelmed. What a curious spectacle for a philosophical mind! 
Everything recalled Napoleon, the furniture, the supper, the guests. The thought came to me that among all those who were united there, there were some who had trembled before the Emperor when he had vanquished them, and others who had formerly solicited his favour or even his smile, and that there was not one present who seemed worthy to be his conqueror. Certainly the situation was interesting, although profoundly sad. Madame de Duras saw in it only the happiness of being the wife of the first gentleman of the king's chamber. The fall of the great man, the invasion of her country, the humiliation of being the host of the conquerors, did not appear to trouble her. As for myself, I had a feeling of shame which was probably not shared by anyone else. Monsieur de la Tour du Pain foresaw that the administrative career, although suited to his taste, would fall into a class inferior to that in which he had a right to be placed. He therefore desired to resume his rank in the diplomatic service where he had been before the revolution. Monsieur de Talleyrand, Minister of Foreign Affairs, proposed to him the embassy to The Hague. The new King of Holland desired it, and my husband willingly accepted this post although he could have aspired to a higher mission. But a word from Monsieur de Talleyrand telling him to accept it gave him to understand that he was destined for other employment. My son Humbert was led away, alas, by the charm of entering the military household of the king. General Dupont, the minister of war, was a former aide-de-camp of my father and professed for me a great attachment Humbert, who was desirous of being married, preferred to remain at Paris rather than to go elsewhere to be prefet in some little city at a distance. He was appointed Lieutenant of the Black Musketeers, a name which came from the colour of their horses. They gave him the grade of Chef d'Escadron in the army. End of Part 2, Chapter 15《2 Chapter 16 of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 16, 1814 to 1815, The First Restoration At the time it was decided to hold the Congress of Vienna, I happened to be one morning in the cabinet of Monsieur de Talleyrand. My husband had gone to Brussels to be present at the coronation of the new king, William I., and to deliver his credentials. He was to return in a day or two. I was preparing to leave the cabinet of the Minister of Foreign Affairs and had already placed my hand on the handle of the door to open it when, looking at Monsieur de Talleyrand, I saw upon his face that expression with which I was familiar when he wished to do someone a good turn in his line. When is Gouvernet coming back? he said. Why, tomorrow, I replied. Well, said he, hasten his return, because he must set out for Vienna. For Vienna? I exclaimed, and why? You understand nothing. He is going as minister to Vienna, while waiting for the Congress to open, when he will be one of the ambassadors. I made another exclamation, and he continued, It is a secret. Do not speak of it to anyone, and send your husband to me as soon as he arrives. I waited impatiently, keeping the secret of the good news except from my son Humbert. This nomination aroused a great deal of envious feeling towards my husband. Madame de Duras was wild. She would like to have seen Monsieur de Chateaubriand obtain the post. Adrien de Laval was not even able to console himself with the promise of the embassy to Spain. Everyone cried out that it was an abuse because my husband had also kept his place at The Hague. We decided in the family, though with great regret on my part, that Monsieur de la Tour du Pin should leave alone for Vienna, and that I should remain at Paris to occupy myself with the marriage of Humbert. My husband wrote to our Gustave son-in-law, who was desirous of entering the diplomatic career in his country, and invited him to come to Vienna. 
either as his private secretary or simply as a looker-on since having become a subject of the low countries he was no longer french we thought that if monsieur de la tour du pin remained at vienna after the congress we would have no difficulty in obtaining from the king of holland a position for august as attache at the vienna legation these projects like many others were upset by events both public and private it was arranged that i should accompany my husband as far as brussels there he would be joined by his son-in-law and i would take my daughter and her child back to paris with me this plan was carried out our trip to brussels and back passed very agreeably although i felt very sad and disappointed at not accompanying my husband to vienna there was no reason then to suppose that his absence would be prolonged as it was in reality besides the assurance had been given me that two special couriers would set out every week from the foreign affairs which permitted me to hope that i would receive regularly news as fresh as possible from my husband on our return to paris we found news from our travellers i settled in my apartment and charlotte took possession of the rooms previously occupied by her father general dupont who was still very devoted to my interests arranged to have the cross of the legion of honour given to auguste as a reward for his excellent services as sous-prefet at amiens at the moment of the restoration i sent it to him at vienna and it gave him great pleasure my poor charlotte had the misfortune at this time to lose her little girl who was carried off in the short space of two days the next day monsieur de liederkerke arrived unexpectedly from vienna charged with dispatches it was necessary for him to set out on his return the following day the despair of charlotte over the loss of her child suggested to me the thought of sending her to vienna with her husband as her father loved her tenderly her presence there would be a great pleasure for him also i possessed an excellent travelling calèche i took charge of the purchase and packing in all details of the elegant toilettes to be worn by my daughter at the fates of the coming congress besides i placed at her disposal my maid who was a very experienced person thanks to my usual activity the resolution once made the second day following my daughter was ready to set out she left for vienna with her husband who was carrying dispatches from monsieur de talleyrand who had not yet left paris i remained alone with cecile then fifteen years of age and my two sons humbert and aymar it may be interesting to state how i passed my time after this restoration of the monarchy i went to the tuileries when the king received the ladies about once or twice a week as a former dame de palais of the queen i had the honours that is to say instead of mingling with the crowd of ladies who were assembled in the first salon called diane while waiting for the king to be rolled into the throne room for he was not able to walk i took my place immediately as well as the other women who enjoyed the same privilege on the benches which were arranged around the throne room there we found many gentlemen who had also the entrees and seated very comfortably we talked until the moment when the king was announced when we rose and took a more conventional and respectful attitude then we filed one by one before the royal armchair the king always had something droll or kind to say to me this same winter the duc de berry gave two balls to which he invited all the principal members of the bonaparte party the duchesses de rovigo de bassano and so on none of them danced and all had a very disagreeable air in spite of the advances and the attentions of the prince and his aides de camp madame de durin and i took to one of these balls albertine de stal after having obtained the consent of her mother who in spite of her fifty years was always dressed herself like a tightrope dancer 
we had been permitted to dress her to our taste. Everyone found her so changed and so improved that from that time on she abandoned her former costume of wearing English dresses. The Duc de Bois fell in love with her, and if I am not mistaken, it was at one of these balls that he decided to demand her hand in marriage. Since I have named Madame de Stael, this is the moment to say that shortly after my return to Paris, after the restoration, I had renewed my former acquaintance with her. I had already seen her nevertheless in 1800, when I arrived from England, a little before the time when Napoleon obliged her to leave Paris, and had also met her at different periods since then. At the time of the 18 Fructidor, she had shown herself very revolutionary, carried away by her intimate relations with Benjamin Constant. Her last transformation had been accomplished in England, whence she returned a royalist. She received at her house all the notable personages from all the countries of Europe who were present in Paris during the winter of 1814 and 1815. I happened to be in her salon the evening of the day when the Duke of Wellington arrived in Paris. One hundred other persons, equally curious to see this personage, already well known, were also there. My relations with the Duke went back to my childhood. Our ages were about the same, and Lady Mornington, his mother, had been closely associated with my grandmother, Madame de Rotte. Young Arthur Wellesley, his sister Lady Anne, and I had passed many evenings together. Later I again met Lady Anne in England at Hampton Court, when I went to see the old stadtholder, the Prince d'Orange. I was received by the Duke as an old friend. In this salon, where all eyes were fixed upon him, but where he knew hardly anyone, he was very glad to find someone to talk with him. During the sojourn that the Duke made at Paris before going to the Congress of Vienna, I met him almost every day. I presented my son Umber to him, and he showed him much kindness. Umber spoke English perfectly, as he had become familiar with this language both in America and in England. He had also a good acquaintance with Italian, this winter, when Paris was full of strangers, he was frequently taken for either an Englishman or an Italian. On leaving Paris, the Duke of Wellington set out for the Congress, where Monsieur de Talleyrand was already present. One evening, during the first days of March, I was in the apartment of Madame de Duras at the Tuileries. There were many people there, including General de Lolois and his wife, Madame de Lolois appeared to fear something, and showed a great desire to leave, especially when Monsieur de Duras passed through the salon after the king had retired. She rose and left the room, taking her husband with her. I remained behind and waited for Madame de Duras to return from the room of her husband, where she had followed him. I saw that she was very much troubled, and she said to me, Something terrible has happened, but Amédée is not willing to explain. I then returned home, accompanied by Umber, and we made all the conjectures possible, except the right one. The following morning, the news of the debarkation of Napoleon at the Golfe of Juan spread through Paris. The news was brought by Lord Lucan. Having left the evening before for Italy, at several stages from Paris, he met the courier who was coming from Lyon with the news. He immediately turned around and came back to Paris, where he spread the news. The results of this event belong to the domain of history. I will therefore only recount those which concern me personally. I was too well acquainted on the one hand with the court, and on the other with the strength of the Napoleonic party, to have for a moment any doubts regarding the efficacy of the measures which would be adopted. Monsieur de la Tour du Pain, although one of the four ambassadors of France at the Congress of Vienna, and employed per interim in the diplomatic affairs of France in Austria, 
had nevertheless retained his post of French minister to Holland, I felt that I could not remain at Paris when Napoleon was about to arrive there, and that I ought to go to Brussels or The Hague. My plans were submitted to the King by Monsieur de Jaucourt, Minister of Foreign Affairs per interim. He approved of my purpose, and I therefore prepared to leave. Humbert, as soon as the departure of the King was decided upon, was not able to leave the quarters of the musketeers. Consequently, I was obliged to complete alone all the arrangements for my trip, which I was about to undertake with my daughter Cécile, sixteen years of age, and my son Emma, who was eight. In the evening, I went to the Bureau of the Minister of Finance to obtain the amount of the salary due Monsieur de la Tourupin, which I wished to take with me. The same evening, 19th of March, 1815, the King was to leave at midnight. On entering the cabinet of the minister, Monsieur Louis, with whom I had been well acquainted for a long time, I found him in a state of terrible rage, showing me a hundred little barrels, similar to those in which anchovies are sold, he said, Look, I have had these barrels prepared, each of which contains ten thousand or fifteen thousand francs in gold. I wish to confide one to each of the bodyguard ordered to accompany the king, and these gentlemen refused to take charge of them, under the pretext that it was not part of their duty. While saying these words, he signed my voucher for the sum which I was to receive at once. I next took the money to my man of affairs, in order to have him change it into gold. I had strongly urged Monsieur Louis to let me have one of the barrels of gold in his cabinet, but he absolutely refused. When I left my man of affairs, which was after nine o'clock, he told me to come back at eleven o'clock, and that he would then give me the gold which he had procured. I then went to see my aunt, Madame Denin, who had also decided to leave to make my adieu. I found her in company with Monsieur de Lally in a state of great trouble, packing, gesticulating, urging her fat friend, who was finishing nothing. On seeing me, she cried, But are you not going to leave, that you have such a tranquil air? I left her in the midst of her packages to go and take leave of Monsieur de Jaucourt, my minister, to have him visé my passport and obtain an order for the post-horses, a very necessary thing, for it would probably have been impossible to find a single one at midnight. Finally, at exactly eleven o'clock, I returned to my man of affairs, Rue Saint anne He handed me twelve thousand francs in rolls of Napoleon's. I had a cabriolet hired by the hour. Getting into the carriage, I said to the coachman, Home. I was living at six, Rue de Varennes. We wished to take the route by the carousel, but on account of the departure of the king, no one was allowed to pass. My coachman then kept along the Rue de Rivoli. At the moment we arrived at the Pont Louis the Sixteenth, now Pont de la Concorde, he heard the clock strike twelve. Stopping short, he declared that for nothing in the world would he go another step. His home, he said, was at Chaillot, and the gates would be closed at midnight. He demanded to be paid and invited me to continue my route on foot. I used in vain all of my eloquence and promised him a superb pourboire if he would take me only to the point where we met another hack. He refused. I was obliged to descend from the carriage, although seized with a mortal terror. Fortunately, at this moment, I heard the noise of a carriage. It was a hack, and vacant, thank God. I entered and offered the coachman a generous gratification to take me home. As soon as I arrived, I sent in search of the post-horses. In spite of my service extraordinaire, in spite of the signature of the minister, I waited until six o'clock in the morning for two miserable horses which were to be attached to a little caleche, in which I was to take my place with Emma, Cécile, and a little Belgian maid whom I had kept in my service. Our journey was not marked by any incident. We arrived safe and sound at Brussels, where I took a little lodging, Rue de l'Amour, 
with a lawyer named Monsieur Ua. He has been since, I think, Minister of Leopold I, King of the Belgians. I was very impatient to receive news from Vienna. The dispatch of the couriers who were usually sent to the foreign affairs, and by whom my husband and my daughter Charlotte wrote me, had undoubtedly been interrupted. Although I had advised them both of my departure for Brussels, I had good reason to feel that I would be a long time without news, which indeed was what happened. At Brussels I found all the persons of my acquaintance, both Belgian and French. Everyone received me cordially, with the exception of the Bonapartists. The King of Holland, William I, was at Brussels. I went to see him, and he received me cordially. We were seated upon a sofa in the former cabinet of Monsieur de la Tour du Pin. Turning to me, he said, In the salon, I try to find the inspiration to make myself loved like your husband. Alas, the poor prince did not succeed. I spoke to him urgently regarding the interests of my son-in-law, who had now become his subject. Probably it was this conversation which opened to him the diplomatic career. A little later my daughter Charlotte arrived alone from Vienna, accompanied by her maid and the valet of her father. She informed me that the Congress had dissolved at the news of the landing of Napoleon at Cannes. Everyone had left in haste, and the powers, who were all ready to become enemies, had become reconciled before the imminent danger. They only thought now of making France pay dearly for the welcome given the hero who, in making her so powerful and glorious, had raised up for her so many enemies. In the southern provinces, the Duc d'Angoulême had brought together a kind of party which might have become important under another chief. Someone was wanted to take to this prince the assurance of the union of the powers to overwhelm Napoleon. Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, with his usual zeal, accepted the mission of going to Marseille to join the Duke. He set out, accompanied by his son-in-law, who went as far as Genoa, whence he brought me at Brussels news from my husband. Young Liederkerk rejoined his wife in that city, and I was able to inform him on his arrival that I had assured his position with the King, his master. End of Part 2 Chapter 16《Post Script of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Editor The memoirs of Madame de la Tour du Pin were written from time to time with long interruptions. Commenced on the first day of January 1820, the last pages of the first part were not finished or put in final shape until about twenty years later. The second part was not begun until February 1843, and at the time of her death, ten years later, had been completed only to the month of March 1815. On the death of the author, the manuscript of the Journal d'une femme de cinquante ans passed into the hands of her son, Emma Marquis de la Tour du Pin, who had been born at Le Bouille, the 18th of October 1806, on his death at Fontainebleau, the 4th of March, 1867, he left the manuscript to his nephew Adelin, Comte de Lidecaque Beaufort, who himself confided it a short time before his death to one of his sons, the Colonel Comte Aymar de Lidecaque Beaufort, who published it at Paris in 1906. The book met with an immediate and well-deserved success. From the preface to the original edition by the Comte Aymar de Lidecaque Beaufort. With the Marquise de la Tour du Pin disappeared one of the last vestiges of the high society of the period before the Revolution, of which the traditions have today completely vanished. The reader of these memoirs cannot fail to appreciate the high qualities of heart and soul and mind shown by the author. Those who knew her both esteemed and loved her. They united in saying that rarely was greater stability united to greater charms, 
more constant fidelity to duty, to greater kindliness. Endowed with a retentive memory, which recalled in her conversation the varied recollections of so many different periods, Madame de la Tour du Pin interested to the highest degree the thoughtful and serious-minded, as she attracted to her the young, whose tastes she understood, and whose faults she excused. At the moment of the debarkation of Napoleon at the Golf Chuan, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin was at the capital of Austria, where he had been sent after the first restoration, first as minister per interim, and then as one of the plenipotentiaries of France to the Congress of Vienna. After having signed the famous declaration of the 13th of March, 1815, which placed Napoleon outside the law, he went, accompanied by Monsieur de Talleyrand, to Toulon, to endeavour to hold Marechal Massena, governor of that place, in the service of the king, and from there to Marseille to confer with the Duc de Riviere. After this, his mission was to rejoin in the south the Duc d'Angoulême, who had received from the king the order to go to Nîmes, but having learned at Marseille the news of the surrender of this prince at Pont Saint-Esprit, after having taken, in concert with the Duc de Riviere, some indispensable measures, he chartered a vessel in order to go to Genoa, whence he expected to return to Vienna. The bad weather, or rather the ill will of the captain of this vessel, forced him to go to Barcelona. From there, by way of Madrid, he proceeded to Lisbon, where he embarked for London. During the twenty-four hours that he remained in London, he had the honour of seeing the Duchesse d'Angoulême, and put her in touch with the situation in France. The night following this interview, he left for Dover, passed over to Ostend, and went to Ghent, where he joined Louis the Eighteenth. After the Battle of Waterloo, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin returned to Paris at the same time with the King. In the month of August following, he took part in the general elections as President of the Electoral College of the Department of the Somme. The 17th of the same month, he was named Peer of France by Louis the Eighteenth. As stated in the memoirs of his wife, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, while acting as one of the plenipotentiaries of France at the Congress of Vienna, had kept the post to which he had been appointed a short time before of Minister to the Low Countries. In October 1815, he went to Brussels to hand his credentials to the King, William I, and to be present at his coronation. Having returned to Paris a short time later to take his seat in the Chamber of Peers, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin took part during the first days of December in the debates over the trial of Maréchal Ney. He voted in favour of his condemnation, but at the same time made a formal declaration in which he stated that he thought that the Maréchal was worthy of the clemency of the king. As is well known, the clemency of the king was not accorded. About the 1st of February 1816, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin returned to The Hague to take up his duties as Minister Plenipotentiary to the Court of the Low Countries. In the month of September 1818, the Duc de Richelieu summoned Monsieur de la Tour du Pin to act as his assistant at the Congress of Aix-la-Chapelle, the object of which was to arrange the conditions for the evacuation of the French territory by the foreign troops. Immediately after the closing of this Congress, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin returned to his post at The Hague. At the end of the year 1819, he went again to Paris to take his seat in the Chamber of Peers at the opening of the session, and was there at the time of the assassination of the Duc de Berry, the 13th of February 1820. A little later, in 1820, he was appointed Ambassador at Turin, and immediately joined his post, which he did not leave until the month of January 1830, except for a sojourn of four months at Rome in 1824. In the month of January 1830, Monsieur de la Tour du decided to retire from public life, as he was worn out, and also dissatisfied at the turn taken by events. He accordingly took up his residence at Versailles, 
where he was living at the time of the revolution of July 1830. The 2nd of August, at three o'clock in the morning, he left Versailles and directed his steps towards Orléans, thinking that the king, in leaving by way of Rambouillet, would take this route to go to Tours. The following day, learning of the abdication of the king and of his departure for Cherbourg, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin resolved to proceed to his estate at Le Bouille, near saint andre de Cubzac. From there he addressed a letter to Monsieur Pasquier, President of the Chamber of Peers, in which he advised him that he was not willing to take the new oath of allegiance which was demanded of him, because it was directly contrary to that which he had already taken to Charles X. This letter was laid before the Chamber during the session of the 21st of August, and appeared in the Moniteur of the following day. The events of the month of August had at the same time put an end to the mission with which Monsieur de la Tour du Pin was charged in connection with the King of Sardinia. Free, therefore, from all engagements, he passed the end of the year 1830 quietly on his estate at Le Bouille. During the course of the year 1831, his youngest son, Aymar, became involved in the movement in the Vendée, and was arrested and put in prison. His father, not wishing to be separated from him, spent the four months of his detention with him. As soon as he was liberated, in April 1832, Aymar again went to the Vendée to rejoin the Duchesse de Berry. The failure of this attempt is well known. After the arrest of Madame, Aymar was once more pursued but he succeeded in finding refuge in the island of Jersey in the month of November 1832. During his absence, he was condemned to death on account of his participation in the attempt of the Duchesse de Berry. Several of the newspapers having attacked his son in terms which appeared outrageous to Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, the latter came vigorously to the defence of his son in a letter which was published in the Guienne. As a result, he was put on trial before the Cour d'Assise at Bordeaux, and the 15th of December, 1832, was condemned to pay a fine of 1,000 francs and to three months in prison. These three months, from the 20th of December, 1832, to the 20th of March, 1833, he was confined to the Fort du Ha, in company with his wife, who refused to be separated from him. On leaving prison, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin settled at Nice, where his wife and son came to rejoin him. Having been compelled by political reasons to leave the city, he proceeded to Turin and from there to Pignerol, where he resided until the 28th of August, 1834. At this time, urgent business interests recalled Monsieur and Madame de la Tour du Pin to France. Here they remained exactly one year, and then again left France with the plan of settling at Lausanne, where they arrived towards the end of the month of November 1835, after a sojourn of several weeks at Suze. The 26th of February 1837, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin died at Lausanne at the age of 78 years. The Marquise de la Tour du Pin has recounted to us in her recollections all the notable events of the period of her life comprised between her childhood and the end of the month of March 1815. Her history from that time on was closely connected with that of her husband, whom she followed to The Hague and later to Turin. She also accompanied him to Italy and then to Switzerland in the voluntary exile which he imposed upon himself in order to share that of his son Emma, and she was at the bedside of her husband at Lausanne at the moment of his death in February 1837. Some time afterwards, with her son Emma, she left for Italy and took up her final residence at Pisa in Tuscany, where she died the 2nd of April 1853, at the age of 83 years. The Marquise de la Tour du Pin had six children, three sons, Humbert, Edward and Aymar, and three daughters, Seraphine, Charlotte and Cécile. Two of her children, Seraphine and Edward, died in infancy. 
in the interval between march eighteen fifteen the date at which the recollections end and the first of january eighteen twenty the date at which madame de la tour du pin began to write her memoirs she lost two other children her eldest son humbert and her youngest daughter cecile humbert de la tour du pin was born at paris the nineteenth of may seventeen ninety during the last years of the empire he was sous-préfet at florence and later at sens at the time of the first restoration he was appointed officer in the corps of the mousquetaire noir and became later aide-de-camp of marechal victor duc de Berlin. he died under circumstances which were very sad and very dramatic at the time of his appointment to the military household of the duc de Berlin, among the aides-de-camp of the marechal was the commandant malandin an officer who had arisen from the ranks he was rough and uneducated but audacious and courageous with an open and loyal heart but very susceptible upon the point of honour he had won every one of his grades upon the different fields of battle of the empire the very day that humbert took up for the first time his service with the marechal on entering the quarters of the aides-de-camp he encountered the commandant Malandin. The latter addressed him in a vein of pleasantry regarding some unimportant detail of his uniform, but in terms which were coarse and unbecoming. Before Humbert could make any reply, the Maréchal entered upon a tour of inspection, and while he was there gave the commandant a mission to the Minister of War. As soon as Humbert was able to leave, he went immediately to the hotel occupied by his family and entered the cabinet of his father. Here he recounted the incident, without omitting any of the details, except that he stated that the person involved was not himself, but one of his friends. He then asked his father what his friend ought to do. His father replied, Challenge the aggressor, and if apologies are offered, refuse them. That evening, Humbert sent a challenge to Malandin. The meeting was arranged for the following morning in the Bois de Boulogne. The weapons selected were pistols, and the distance was twenty-five paces. The duel took place the following morning in a clearing in the Bois de Boulogne. When the distance had been measured off, and the adversaries had been placed in position, before the signal had been given, the commandant Monondin gave a sign that he wished to speak, and in a loud tone he pronounced these words. Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, in the presence of these gentlemen, I think that I ought once more to declare to you that I regret my wretched pleasantry. Two good fellows ought not to kill each other for that. Humbert hesitated a moment, and then walked slowly towards the commandant. All the assistants had a feeling of secret relief at seeing the favourable turn which the affair had taken. But when the young man arrived close, to his adversary instead of offering him his hand he raised his arm and with the butt of his pistol struck malandin on the forehead monsieur he said i think that now you will not refuse to fight after such a scene only one denouement was possible the signal was given monsieur de la tour du pin fired first and missed his adversary the commandant then fired in turn and shot Humbert through the heart. Cécile de la Tour du Pin was born the 13th of February 1800, under circumstances which have been related in the recollections at Wildeshausen, a little city upon the borders of Hanover and of the Grand Duchy of Oldenburg. During the month of September 1816 at The Hague, where Monsieur de la Tour du Pin occupied the post of minister plenipotentiary of france to the court of the low countries she became the fiancée of charles comte de mercy argento the latter at this time had served for ten years in the french army with great distinction he had taken part in the campaigns of the empire and had gained particular renown at the battle of anno where he received the cross of the legion of honour shortly afterwards cecile had taken ill and in spite of every care continued to grow worse 
she was ordered by her physicians to go from the hague to nice in order to find a milder climate but she did not recover her health and died in that city the twentieth of march eighteen seventeen and was buried in the cemetery there on the death of his fiancée comte charles de merciagento abandoned himself to despair renouncing his brilliant career in the army he left the military service and entered into orders he became the archbishop of tyre and died the sixteenth of november eighteen seventy nine at the age of ninety three years during their residence at turin which has been spoken of above monsieur and madame de la tour du pin were once more called upon to endure a new sorrow charlotte the only daughter who was still living and who had married the twentieth of april eighteen thirteen at brussels comte auguste de de beaufort died at the chateau of faublanc near lausanne the first of september eighteen twenty two at that time she was on her way from turin to rejoin at Bern her husband who was at that time minister of the low countries near the helvetian republic charlotte left two children a son adelin born at brussels eleventh of march eighteen sixteen and a daughter cecile born at the hague twenty fourth of august eighteen eighteen after the death of charlotte of the six children aymar alone survived on the death of the author the manuscript of the journal d'une femme de cinquante ans passed into the hands of her son aymar marquis de la tour du pin who had been born at le bouille the eighteenth of october eighteen hundred and six end of postscript end of recollections of the revolution and the empire by henriette lucille la tour du pin gouverne edited abridged and translated by walter gear